This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. This is A Different Perspective with Kevin Randall. A retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Kevin Randall has been studying UFOs for nearly 50 years. Kevin has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases in the world and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs. Considered one of the leading experts into the Roswell UFO crash of 1947, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st century. Now, here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And good evening. We are back from our 167-hour hiatus. And for those of you just joining the program, don't worry. This is, in fact, the beginning. I'm joined with John by John Greenwald today, or with John Greenwald. Uh, he is a producer and writer known for Unsealed Conspiracy Files, National Geographic, Hitler and the Occult, and Secrets of the Freemasons. But he's best known as the creator of the Black Vault, which is a website that houses thousands and thousands of UFO-related documents obtained through the FOIA requests from dozens of government agencies. He's been the master of ceremonies at many UFO-related conference, conferences. I always have trouble with my speech for some reason. Conferences and symposiums, and he is one of the leaders of the UFO community. And anybody who's been around for more than 10 or 15 minutes has probably seen him in his UFO duty. So welcome to A Different Perspective, John Greenwald. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. And we won't even go on to all the troubles that we had getting you here. We'll talk <laughs> I love about technology, some- but sometimes it just works against us, doesn't it? <laughs> we'll talk about snowstorms and tornadoes and hurricanes and all of that as an alibi for this. <laughs> yeah, it- that's right. Anyway, um, as I mentioned, you are the creator of the Black Vault, and I think you did that while you were still a teenager. Is that correct? I did, yeah. I started when I was 15 years old and uh, just got struck by curiosity and started teaching myself the Freedom of Information Act, and and I thought, you know, if I was going after these documents, other people would want to see them too, and that's how I started the Black Vault uh, now over 20 years ago. So you were – you started it as – an interest in UFOs and looking for FOIA documents, or were there other interests that kind of inspired your uh, FOIA requests? Actually, it, UFOs was the number one. And, and when I was a teenager, uh, like you said, 15 years old, I, I didn't really expect that I would be a researcher per se. Like, I just wanted to know what was out there. And even at the time, this was before Google was even Google. I mean, you know, now it's now it's a verb, but back then it was Alta Vista was I was using, and I would type in UFO. And even back then, back in 1996, you'd get hundreds of thousands of 
of of web pages on UFOs. Now it's millions, obviously, but uh, this was in '96, so the web was still in its infant stages. And I was fascinated by the topic, but what was very uh, worrisome to me was trying to figure out like, well, what was real and what was not. You read one story about one incident uh, on one web page or one book, and then you read another source on the same exact incident, but you get different facts. And, you know, I joke about this, especially when I do public speaking, but at that moment when I was so frustrated trying to figure out what's right, what's wrong, I made kind of the stupidest decision that I thought of my life, but it ended up being the best one I ever made. And I thought to myself, you know, if I'm going to find the truth about this, if anybody's going to be honest to me uh, and honest with me about the UFO topic, it'll be the United States government. And that's what I thought. I was young and stupid, but I really <laughs> thought, okay, let's go after the U.S. government documents because they won't lie to me, right? Right. And, you know, I'll stress that young and naive uh, point about being 15 years old and thinking that was the way to go. So I had learned about the Freedom of Information Act. I had not known what it was prior to uh, seeing a, a website with a couple documents on it and read through what has been infamously known uh, in ufology as the 1976 Iran incident. And that was the first four page government document I ever read. And that's what got me hooked. And that's where I learned of the FOIA and whatever a Freedom of Information Act request was. And they said, hey, if you don't believe this document's real, you too can get it. And so I just kind of gave myself a crash course in it, uh, started firing off FOIA requests, 5, 10, literally 40, 50 at a time. I was sending these things out. And, uh, and here we are 20 years later, and I just per, uh, surpassed 1.5 million pages. So even though I, w I didn't find the... 100% absolute truth, and they were not lying to me. I didn't find that, uh, but I did get much more than I bargained for. So your interest was to begin the Black Vault, or it was actually uh, interest in finding out what is the truth about UFOs. And you can take a look at all these, uh, what did you say, 1.5 million pages? On Yeah, and now in fairness, that's not all on UFOs, but yeah, that's that's what I've obtained through the FOIA. And you can find those at www.theblackvault.com and take a look at it for yourself. We're going to have to take a quick break here. Uh, for more information about everything we talk about on the program, there are other sites you can take a look at. But we will return right after these quick messages. Thank you. This is Johanna Carroll, host of Dialogue with Divinity on the Exxon Broadcast Network. While walking along Kanapali Beach in Maui this past year, I kept discovering all these shells and coral in the shape of hearts. My Dialogue with Divinity was very simple. Do you want me to do a retreat to heal people's hearts in Maui next year? And of course, the answer was yes. As a master spiritual teacher, I am offering you a neat retreat called RISE, May 8th through the 12th, 2017, and the chance of a lifetime to rest at a five-star resort for five days and experience a spiritual renewal of your heart and soul. Kanapali is one of the top five beaches in the world. This stunning resort has undergone a $40 million renovation. I walked the entire property, checked out the room choices on your behalf, and I must say, it is stunning. Our conference room faces the ocean with sliding glass doors. Maui is known as Mother Maui because it is a soft, gentle, healing energy. In the embrace of Mother Maui, you will feel yourself rising from the limitations of an ordinary life to an extraordinary journey of peace, bliss, and harmony a greater sense of clarity. Our RISE retreat ignites renewal in the sacred elements of air, water, earth, fire, and wind. There's plenty of free time to enjoy all that Maui has to offer. 
A small deposit is required now to reserve your space as this retreat, it will sell out. For more details, please go to johannacarroll.com and register today. Aloha and I'll see you in mystical Maui. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Mnemology science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Mnemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. are back with John Greenwald, who created the Black Vault, which has 1.5 million pages of government documents, not all of which relate to UFOs. And he was talking about how his uh, FOIA requests have worked. And that kind of sparks a question in my, my mind, which is I have found in the last couple of years, last several years, that FOIA doesn't seem to work as well as it used to. Is, is, John, have you found that or is FOIA still working well for you? I, you know, I'm a big advocate for the fact that it does work. Um, what I have seen in the last few years more than anything is the amount of time that agencies take to respond. Uh, I've had requests that literally have taken uh, 13, 14, 15 years to get a response, literally, and that's not an exaggeration. Uh, so when you, when you look at that, it's a very frustrating process, but I, I do feel that it works. It also depends on what agency you go to and what you're asking for. The UFO topic, which obviously we're focusing on me, started branching out and and I started dealing with other topics other than UFOs. Uh, You name the government secret, I've probably done some type of request on it. When I started tackling those other topics, what I was finding Uh, was a little bit more for myself, a piece of the puzzle, meaning it was easier for me to get an agency to release, let's say, uh, top secret documents on nuclear weapons or biological weapons or something to that effect. It was easier for me to get that uh, than it was UFO information. And so I had to really kind of ask myself, well, why is that? Why is it easier for me to get those types of documents than UFOs? And it just did not make any sense. But to me, that was part of the puzzle. To me, that helped me understand a little bit that the UFO topic was something that was heavily top secret. Uh, It was thing that the government didn't want us to know about that there were these other, what you would consider these incredibly top secret other topics, and yet I was able to extract information on that, but UFOs were, were still very problematic. So it, it, even though as time passed on, the time increased with some of the agencies, but I do still feel that it's a very worthwhile act, and you still can get information. Could it be that they... Uh, their lack of response on UFO topics would be that they just didn't think it was important enough to, t- to take the time to do, that it's something uh, uh, out on the fringe and they don't want to respond to it, not because it's well hidden or it needs to be hidden, but because they just think it's a, a useless topic to pursue and they'll get to it when they finally get around to it. Well, it's a good question, but the law 
would easily answer that. And the law states that it doesn't matter what you are requesting. The agency has to respond to what you are requesting. Now, they might, might give you there's no records on a particular topic, and that's fine. But they do have to follow the law. I mean, if you ask for everything on Santa Claus, um, and and they have to process the request. They can't ignore it and say, well, Greenwald's asking about Santa Claus. They have to process it. Uh, if you ask for a, everything on a you know, cartoon, they got to process it. May yield a no records response, but by law, they have to deal with it. They can't put it aside and say, well, that's silly. Uh, essentially, the law allows for no opinion to take over. They cannot determine based on their own personal opinion uh, on what the outcome might be to start saying, well, this request is more important or that request is more important. They operate on what's called a first in first out basis. And what that means is, is they go in order, chronological order from one, two, three, four, five, all the way down the line, however many they have to process. Now there's a couple exceptions to that rule. You can request for uh, a request to be expedited, uh, meaning that, that uh, if you are either going through a court case or there is extreme public interest, you can argue for them to speed up the response and maybe cut in line, so to speak, but they do have to process it. So back to your question, no, I don't think that that would be it. Why I say what I do about the UFO topic is when you look at the government documents that they do give you, I'm not saying how they deal with the request. That's not my evidence. My evidence is the documents themselves. When they tell you that no UFO information exists after 1969, and yet all the way up well into the 2000s, I can show that there's absolutely UFO information, it's those types of contradicting statements uh, that really kind of support there is much more to this story. In my argument, if there was nothing to the UFO phenomena, if from 1947 to 1969 they really did their investigation, which ultimately was called Project Blue Book, if they really did their job and there was nothing to it, you wouldn't continually keep hearing lie after lie and seeing them trip up uh, over the years. And yet that is what you see. And so it's not how they handle my requests that I use as evidence. It's what the requests come up with that I can show anybody, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, this is black and white proof that the UFO topic is still heavily classified. You can't argue that. You can argue why it might be classified, sure, and that's a different discussion. But there is something about this topic that the government does not want us to know about. And yet, I can get declassified information on biological weapons and how to make a nuclear bomb. You know, so you, you kind of use those two facts butted up against each other and realize, okay, there's something here. What is it? Is it extraterrestrial? Okay, we can have that conversation too. I'm not saying that that's uh, proof. But what I am saying is they're so adamant about saying X at a press podium or press statement, and they want you to believe that there's nothing to the topic. But when you start asking questions and start utilizing the FOIA, it's a completely different story. Is there something that you think of as your favorite find in the uh, UFO-related FOIA request, something that really got you excited? What really has gotten me excited over the last couple of years, uh, it's very disappointing, but it, it's very exciting. It's not one uh, particular document, but, but, but more of the process of trying to get these UFO documents classified. And there are two agencies that I'll bring up to answer your question, one of which is the National Security Agency, and the other is the Defense Intelligence Agency. Now, a lot of these documents uh, that have surfaced from these two agencies are still to this day heavily redacted or blacked out. Uh, in some cases, the NSA even uses whiteout, so it kind of lessens the visual impact when you show it on television or, or hold it up in front of a group of people. Uh, whiteout doesn't have that same impact, but regardless, it's redacted classified information. Now, under the Freedom of Information Act, you can do a very special type of request, uh, which not many people either even know about or do, which is called an MDR, or a Mandatory Declassification Review. Now, what this simply states is if they release something in 1995, what's classified in 1995 may not necessarily be classified in 2016. And so you can request a mandatory declassification review on a document so they can go back to the originals, not the blacked out one, but the original with all the classified information, re-review it, redact what then is classified in 2016 and release it again. 
Now, you can't do this often. You can only do it once every few years, but you can do it. Now, when I was kind of thinking in the last few years, you know, what can I do with the UFO topic? Because I kind of felt I've kind of tapped quite a few different resources. I thought, well, let's request to the NSA and the DIA, which again are those most heavily classified or redacted UFO documents. Let's request an MDR. It took well over a year for the NSA to respond, and they were first to respond. The NSA told me that out of the – off the top of my head, I think there's about three or 400 pages that they consider UFO-related, that many of which are blacked out top to bottom, either fully exempt from disclosure, which means they don't even black out the pages. They just tell you they're not going to give it to you, or they'll black out and white out pretty much the majority of the page. So there's about 400, three, 400 pages – they told me after a year of waiting that they lost 100% of each and every one of those pages. They were just gone. They only had the redacted versions, uh, the, the, so they couldn't do the review. So forever, we will, we will never know the truth behind those three or 400 pages of NSA material. They did claim there's a document that was an affidavit that was created for a judge during a court case about why the NSA was withholding the quote-unquote UFO documents, uh, these, these, these records. They made two affidavits, one of which was top secret. Uh, the other was a public affidavit. Obviously, the top secret is a little bit more interesting. They were able to find that one, and they released a little bit more of it, uh, but that was it. And about six months after that, I received the response from the Defense Intelligence Agency. So finally, I thought, okay, maybe these guys will release uh, – they have a couple hundred pages themselves – Maybe they'll release something interesting with this review. I'll give you 20 bucks if you can think what they said. And it was the exact same thing that the National Security Agency said. Completely different agency, completely different FOIA request, completely different office, and they lost 100% of their UFO material. Were, they, so, were, you look, were you looking for the same documents from these two agencies, or were they no, different documents? No, 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 sir, I was not. No, they're, they're 100% different. The NSA material are what's called comment reports, C-O-M-I-N-T. Uh, they're all the, the, the intelligence papers from around the world, around the globe. Uh, the, the NSA wants you to believe that, that the blacked out information is what they call sources and methods, and that's fine. Maybe, it, maybe that is true. We, we really don't know for sure. But now they're claiming that everything is lost. The DIA have a completely – they have a completely different set of documents, 100 percent different. They are not related at all, and yet they claimed to have lost 100 percent of that. Now, the well, likelihood let me, let me, let me of – Let me ask you a sure. question that, that springs to my mind. Did they uh -huh. say they lost the documents or they had been destroyed? Lost them. They said lost them because I, I was thinking yes, that, sir. that mm -hmm. as a, a former uh, – uh, officer that it was uh, required to destroy classified material when it became obsolete for whatever reason. And I remember filling out lots and lots of documents about this. We destroyed this document to prove that it had been properly destroyed, that that could have been the, the case. But they actually said they had lost those documents. Yeah, I, I it's a great it's a, it's a great question, but they do straight out say that they lost them. And I've got the NSA letter to prove it. If you go to the blackvault.com, you can you can uh, see the letter and and they say that they that they lost them, that they cannot find the original unredacted versions. So for whatever reason, they redacted them, released those and have not either found or looked for the originals until I requested them to. And then they were say, these, oops, we didn't, these, we didn't find were these it. Top, were these top secret documents? Or, or uh, just... ma Yeah, many of, many of which were top secret. Um, top secret all the way down to confidential. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm giving you a blanket answer between two agencies. Um, but yeah, there's, there, there's documents on pretty much every classification level, but there are many that are top secret. Uh, those mainly within the NSA holdings, and again, those are are gone. And to your point, also, agencies are very open about uh, the destruction of documents. Uh, as the digital age has has largely taken over, uh, I feel destroying documents should just never happen. That that's just the history buff in me. But regardless, some agencies still do that. Uh, I'll bring the FBI in as a prime example. There are many times I've gone after records of somebody or on somebody. And the FBI told me an exact date, 
the record number and uh, and the fact that it was destroyed, not lost, but destroyed. So even though they destroy the documents, they still keep very detailed records of that destruction because it is 100 percent illegal to destroy a, a document like that without proper authority. Uh, and in order to do that, they have what's called a records retention schedule. Now, that's what tells an agency I'm how have, long they keep information and, and what do they do with it. I'm going to have to break in here because we're getting right up against our break time sure. again. Uh, for more information, you can go to www.theblackvault.com, uh, hosted by John Greenwald, or you can take a look at uh, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. We will return momentarily with John Greenwald and learn a little bit more about UFOs and destruction of government documents. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at... Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying. 
are back with John Greenwald talking about the Black Vault and FOIA requests and how all of this works and the destruction of classified material. And before I get back to John, I would just like to say as an Air Force intelligence officer, I was actually required to destroy classified material periodically. And oftentimes it was material that became obsolete or it was no longer uh, reliable or it was no longer in date. We had to get rid of it for the storage facilities that we had. And but but we were getting this all this documentation from other sources. We weren't creating it ourselves. So there should be an ultimate source somewhere that you can go to to get the to get the documents. And from what John is saying here, I believe that the ultimate source he's looking for would be the NSA or the or the DIA. They should have the original documents there, and I'm not sure why they would be destroying them. I can understand destroying them at the local level because we just did not have the uh, capability to endlessly. A lot of documents were replaced by later editions, and I'm thinking specifically of the CAA fact book. We used to get two, an unclassified version and a classified version, and every six months we'd have to destroy the uh, classified version because it had been replaced by a newer and better book. So, John, you were telling us um, that they had lost the documents, and I was going to point out that it seems to me that would be a crime because you just can't lose Material. And the reason I asked about top secret material, because it's even worse for top secret material, the safeguards uh, in place are much, much higher and much more restricted so that you uh, limit the access to it and you limit the possibility of compromise of those documents. And to admit that they've lost top secret material just strikes me as appalling. Yeah, and and it is. And in fact, uh, while we were on break there, I pulled up the letter, and here's the one line that said it, uh, and I won't uh, bore you to death with the entire letter, but in their official response to me, which was under the mandatory declassification review request, uh, they said, with the exception of the enclosed document, which is that affidavit that I had mentioned to you, the, the Yates affidavit that was given to the judge, with the exception of that, we cannot locate unredacted copies or the original documents that were previously reviewed and released to the public. In essence, they're gone. Uh, now, under the FOIA, they just can't not look because they don't want to or because it's difficult. Under the FOIA, they are mandated to search for those documents. So the fact that they gave up, meaning that they've just exhausted all means to, to, to find these things, means they're gone. That they, that they just cannot find them. And uh, to your point, you're absolutely right. Every document that is created has what's called an OPR, or an Office of Primary Responsibility. And this is where it gets very tricky as an investigator, is that you have to figure out who the OPR is or what the OPR is for a particular document, meaning the originator. That's what it means in plain English, is who originated this document. And in the NSA uh, example here, all of those documents are NSA, they are the OPR. They're, they're the primary office that is responsible for safekeeping, for housing them, and the release authority. Now, a lot of these documents were, uh, we would call it CC'd. You know, they were uh, sent to all other um, agencies that might have an interest in that particular intelligence document. Some UFO documents were sent to uh, literally a page and a half of agencies, meaning uh, they would list one agency per line. So these UFO records were of great interest to many corners of the military and the government. Uh, but if you were to request that one document uh, to, let's say it went to 20 agencies, if you filed 20 requests to all 20 agencies, by law, they would all then forward it all the way back to the OPR, which again would be the NSA, and they're responsible. So in essence, they're playing a game here. I mean, unless this was a, a big error, which is fine, Let's, let's, let's assume that it's true, that somebody just screwed up. They blacked out these things 20, 30 years ago, uh, released them to the public, and, and, and accidentally shredded the originals. Let's just assume that that's true. What are the odds that a second agency with, with completely different records, but uh, related in the sense that they're all UFO related, what are the odds that a completely separate agency did the exact same thing? The odds are astronomical if one did it. I'm sorry. It's just, in my opinion, it is. But the odds of two agencies doing the exact same mistake, shredding all this information, doesn't make sense to me. Well, let's take a look. Let's, let's drive away from the FOIA request for a moment. And let's talk mm -hmm. about UFO sightings. 
UFO cases. Anything that you that you uh, looked at in the FOIA that uh, or, or you got response to that there were interesting UFO sightings, something that you didn't expect in the way of a, uh, a witness uh, the sighting was somehow unusual, anything like that that you found? Well, what I was really interested uh, by when I first started this was the night that 1976 Iran incident. This has been around for a long time, so this is nothing new. I know you're 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 well versed, you know, in these types of documents. But when I read this 20 years ago, when I was 15, the 1976 Iran incident to me is fascinating, because when you read this government document, number one, it shouldn't exist. If you listen to the true quote unquote, true statements that the government wants you to believe, meaning no UFO documents exist after 69, this thing shouldn't even be there. And yet it's one of hundreds of pages within, you know, the intelligence files of the DIA that can you, you can actually can get. You, can you give us a little background on the Turan? Sure. You talked about it and, and some people may not be familiar with it. Absolutely. So in 1976, September to be exact, uh, a base in Tehran was receiving these phone calls uh, in Iran about some mysterious object that was being seen over the city. Now, the base commander, after receiving a couple of, of phone calls, uh, goes out with some field binoculars, looks out, and sees this unidentified craft, whatever it is, you know, aircraft or military craft or commercial craft. He didn't know. It was far enough away he couldn't ID it. was confirmed by radar. And so he scrambled an F-4 Phantom jet to, to go take a look. Now, according to the document, it got about 24, the F-4 Phantom Jet got about 24 nautical miles away from this UFO, and he lost all communications, all controls on the aircraft, according to this document. Now, as he slowly drifted away, he regained everything, and so he returned to base. Now, they just thought it originally probably a plane malfunction of some kind or, you know, whatever it might be, and they scrambled a separate uh, F-4 Phantom Jet. It got within the same distance. To about 24 nautical miles, according to the to the document, and then a second UFO appeared out of the first one that they were chasing. This time, it jetted straight forward towards the F-4. Now, if you're a military pilot and you see something come out of a craft and come right at you, what do you think? It's that hostile. Is, you know, so yeah, exactly. I mean, there's no other way to think about it. So he arms his aim for a missile and he goes to fire. And the minute he presses the button everything shuts down. His communications, control boards, he's got no control to fire that missile. It fails. And so he well, let me, let me sees stop this. Let me, let me ask you a question mm -hmm. here, because you, you say everything failed. Is he still flying the aircraft? Can he pilot? Is it, are the, the it, physical controls? According, yeah, according to the document, he is in a slow uh, uh, descent. That he's that that at this point, I mean, he doesn't just fall out of the the plane at this point. Uh, the document is very nondescript about some of these things. You know, I mean, you want to know more, and the document doesn't really go into detail. Uh, it, it, it does go in. I don't know the exact term because I'm not an Air Force pilot, but uh, the document should, that talks about how he was in a, a slow de descent. Now, the pilot has come out since then. And I go by the description uh, in the document because that's something that's irrefutable. Uh, the, the, the pilot it's himself actually has a slightly different story about, um, uh, you know, about this, this stage of the sighting. And I don't want to speak for him, but he, his facts differ a little bit from the document itself. He, in my opinion, has a, a little bit more of even an elaborate story. It's not like he discounts this. I mean, he, he has... Uh, spoken spoken quite a bit about it over the years. I don't know if he still does, um, but he's spoken quite a bit. I just go by the description of the document. So, so what attempted, I mean by no... He's, he's, he's attempted to fire his missile at this thing coming at him. And for yeah, all of you out there that, that don't don't realize that in, in the military, if they're pointed for, towards you, you immediately assume they're hostile. Uh, if they're flying away from you, then th that's okay. But if they're pointed at you, it's hostile. So he tries to fire his missiles um, from the F-4, and they fail to go off, fail to leave the rails, fail to launch. And he now finds himself a slow descent. Is it toward the object in, in, in toward the object or yeah he was yeah he was in pursuit of the what i'll call the original ufo so at this point now he's got really no controls he's seeing this this what he assumed at first was a missile coming at him and before him loops around and goes back to the original ufo for what it 
what it calls, I think, a perfect rejoin, or, or, or I forget how they exactly they termed it, but it rejoined the original craft. So obviously this was not a missile, uh, so he thought. A third UFO that appeared out of the side of this original UFO. And I mean, I hate the word mothership just in the sense that it's so sci-fi and very Hollywood. But in essence, that is what this document is describing, you know, and you can see why as a 15 year old kid, I was fairly fascinated by this because then a third UFO appears out of the side of the original uh, craft. And then this one goes towards the surface of Earth. Now, whether it landed or hovered above, uh, the document doesn't state, but it did cast a light about a third of a kilometer in diameter. And the so th this is where, again, it gets very strange where the document kind of skips around because you would think, okay, this guy is in a slow descent. Did he want to eject? Why did he not? I mean, what, you know, what, what's going on at this point? And as the document kind of skips a lot of these things, uh, you can deduce that he does regain control and communications. Uh, there was still uh, some kind of spottiness with, with his radio. Um, they do not talk about the UFO and what it happens after. It's kind of like they skipped that. Did, did, like, did it land on Earth, this third UFO? Did little beings come out? Did it explode? Did it fly away? I mean, what happened? You'd want that answer, and yet the document doesn't, doesn't really talk about that. Uh, the pilot turns his, his plane around once he regained all, all controls, uh, saw a fourth UFO on his way back. Uh, this one was dis uh, completely separate from the original object. This was on the other side of the, of the air base. Uh, described it as a cigar-shaped UFO. Uh, the, he was having instrumentation problems, so whatever affected his aircraft stayed with him, meaning he was still having issues. And so he had to go out into the desert for a long descent uh, into a long, a long landing. He didn't have the proper instrumentation to do what he would normally would, so he had to do it the long way. And the, the, the report ended with the fact that that pilot was going to be taken by helicopter out to the site of where this object uh, had cast that light on the ground. Now, he was helicoptered out there, uh, according to the report. Uh, they didn't see anything of note other than a small dwelling not too far away. They knocked on the door and questioned the residents there. They said, did you see anything? And they said, well, we saw a lot of bright lights coming in through the window, uh, but we didn't go outside, and, but we did hear a lot of, of noises, uh, loud noises as well. They collected soil uh, for radiation samples, and the report ended that, that further uh, information and the test results would be forwarded when available. This was September of 1976. The distribution list, what I had mentioned earlier, which is that list at the top of the document that talks about all the agencies that got this, there were a long laundry list of agencies that got this intelligence UFO report the Joint Chief of Staff, even the White House, the NSA, the CIA, the DIA, the FBI, pretty much the who's who of Washington was on the distribution list for this UFO record. John, now, this one John, doc John, yeah. we're going to have to take a quick break here. It's our last gotcha. one before we're, before we're done. For those of you interested in learning more about the Tehran UFO sighting and some of the interesting things that went along with it, you can take a look at www.theblackvault.com. I've also uh, done some things with it in a couple of the books I've done that you might want to take a look at. But we will be back right after this with more of A Different Perspective. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. 
No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secret to everything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secret to everything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genix provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. We are back for the final segment segment with John Greenwald of The Black Vault. That's www.theblackvault.com. And as I say, if you want more information on some of these topics and other things related to UFOs, take a look at uh, kevinrandall.blogspot.com. It's called A Different Perspective, which is cleverly the name of this program. When we left, John was talking about the Tehran in- incident. And I thought maybe a, a quick recap, if I've got it right, we've got a general officer in Tehran who has been alerted to a UFO sighting. It's been uh, picked up on radar. He launches not one, but two fighter aircraft that encounter some kind of um, electromagnetic effects that that wipe out his communications with the aircraft. Uh, We've got something that uh, either shone a light on the ground or landed on the ground and Samples were taken, and it's been distributed to a large number of governmental agencies. So it was something that was very, very important. Was there a final conclusion on this sighting? Anything that were, it was in the documents that suggested what it might have been other than a UFO? 
not in that document. And but you know, just based on uh, the, the the story that that you just uh, summarized there, and what I've been talking about, that document's last line r- results will be forwarded when available shows you that they were actively investigating this, that they were going to have some kind of result. I have filed FOIA requests to every single agency on that distribution list, and then some, and not a single agency has any other documentation on it. So two things either happen. They just didn't care and didn't follow up, which in my opinion is not the right answer, or they are covering something up here, or maybe they lost it. Maybe there is a third, a third option here where they lost it. But regardless, there's nothing there. That that information either was never forwarded or never followed up on. I mean, you can you can fill in the blank. But this this particular document stands out to me alone that there's something to this topic. This is what got me interested, and and I think that it's it's kind of um, black and white on on how I would say how much of a risk the UFO phenomena is. It doesn't matter if it's alien or not. We can have that you know different debate. But the phenomena itself is real. They were never able to identify this particular craft, whatever it was. Uh, here we are in 2016. This was 1976. We, we don't really have technology like that, even today, that can do all those different things all at once and, and seemingly shut down specifically a uh, incoming F-4 Phantom jet. I mean, we, yeah, you can argue maybe we do here in 2016, but... 76, I, I, I kind of argue that this was a little bit well above it and beyond its time. Well, so one thing we should, those types one of thing documents we, stick out to me. One thing we should probably point out is this is 1976, and, and, and Iran was still an ally of the United States. It was before the hostage crisis and all that, and mm-hmm. before we see all the people demonstrating in Tehran against the United States. So there was cooperation between our military and their military and our government and their government, so there was a sharing of information. So we can't say, well, uh, given it's 1976, that we didn't get any further information simply because of the hostilities between the two governments. There was it was at a time when that hostility did not exist so there should have been some kind of follow up if there is in fact a, a, another investigation and i can see where some of the other agencies that would have received this document would have eventually destroyed it as not being pertinent to their uh, mission whatever that mission might be and and i guess mm-hmm. the best best example i can give is when i was in the air force i had a list in uh one of the files of all the POWs being held in Vietnam uh, after, uh, or had been held in Vietnam, I should say. And this was a classified document still. I had absolutely no reason to have that document. I didn't need it, but somehow Mm -hmm. we had gotten on a distribution list and that document came to us. And before we had an operational readiness inspection, I destroyed it. I didn't need Mm -hmm. it. And, and uh, if you go back to the records, you will see that, that we properly destroyed that document. It lists the, the, the date of the document, the name of the document, the subject of the document, and who the destruction officer was, which would be me, and mm-hmm. I was there with my NCO. So, you know, some of the lesser agencies probably don't have the information, but the, the original classifier, the original source, that document should mm-hmm. exist there, there unless they had a reason to destroy it. And if they did destroy it, that should be noted somewhere. Somewhere, and yet it's you know, and and yet it's not. And you, so you look at cases like this, and and you you just drill down into the facts of the story, and you know, just a lot of things just don't match up uh, at all. And so this is this is one that definitely sticks out to me as as some of the more important uh, evidence. And and one last thing I'll point out to you about this document, uh, Kevin, that that I've always found fascinating. You may have a different opinion. But the majority of the versions of this document that were forwarded to all these agencies, because I did receive the, the, the document from a couple different agencies, it was considered unclassified. Well, you know, when I interviewed Marking. I'm sorry, when I interviewed uh, Carmen Morano, who was, I... who was the Project uh, Blue Book officer, he told mm-hmm. me that um, a lot of the stuff in Project Blue Book was not classified. And I went back and looked at the files that I have and found that that's absolutely correct. A lot of the stuff wasn't mm-hmm. classified. So you could, in theory, release it to, to the public. And, and the important point is, if you get rid of it, you do not have to uh, document its destruction. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it, but but I, I think the bigger point to it, in my opinion, is the fact that if this is not classified, if, if because this is an amazing story, no matter which way you slice it or dice it, I feel this particular document is, is fairly amazing because we still don't have an explanation for it. There's no technology that has come out that can ID whatever this was. If this was considered unclassified, what are the top secret UFO related documents that the NSA quote unquote lost? You know, what are all these other documents from the CIA, the DIA, and the NSA? And you can line up quite a few of them that are fairly heavily redacted, that do have secret and top secret stamps on them. If you can read the 1976 Iran incident without a single blacked out, you know, uh, a piece of information, I think there's a name or two blacked out. So I'll correct myself there. But, you know, there's, there's really no largely classified information in it. And the document is consli- considered unclassified. If you can read that, then what in the world can't we read? What in the world are... I was mm-hmm. say, let, me, let me ask a question. I don't mean to interrupt, but we're getting low on time. No, it's all good. I and, got you. And, and uh, you've, gotten, you've gotten some documents that were, de- were heavily redacted, and then you've got subsequent documents that were not as heavily redacted. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And when you got the less heavily redacted documents, um, was there interesting information about UFOs in them, or was it really had to do with sources and other things that might not be related to UFOs? No, I I think there was a lot of information there that that you can see. I mean, to quickly summarize it, you do have flying saucer-shaped craft that are seen around the globe, not just in America, but around the world that the United States government could not identify, or the United States military. How do we know that? Because the reports say they are unidentified. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't be a skeptic on this one in the sense that whatever it is, they, they couldn't identify what in the world it was. I, I always get a kick out of people uh, that, 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 that don't get into the UFO field heavily, but they always think, well, a lot of that stuff are top secret military aircraft or or, you know, the U-2 flights, the CIA tried to glom onto the fact that, that a lot of the UFOs seen in the 50s and 60s were, were flights of the U-2, um, which is all laughable because these documents where they're tagging them as unidentified flying objects, they have descriptions that don't match up into anything that we have flying in the air. When you look at all the facts and just use a little bit of common sense, you, you don't have to scream that it's alien. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is use a little bit of common sense and the, and the company line does not make sense and there are a ton of pieces of the puzzle that you just start putting it all together and you start to see a picture in my opinion that picture is simply a piece of a much bigger puzzle but at least you start using that common sense and logic when looking at this and you realize that there's a lot more to it than i think that the government or the military wants us to know about well we're getting close to the very end here so let me ask you quickly anything that you've got Mm -hmm. uh you're working on that you want to mention here coming up in the near future that uh, people might find of interest? Yeah, I do have a show airing. As you mentioned, I I work as a television producer and writer. I just finished a show on uh, the History Channel. It is called Doomsday, uh, 10 Ways the Planet uh, Will End. And my particular episode is going to be the uh, one of the finales of, of the season. Sadly, I have not been given the air date yet, but I believe it'll be by the end of the year, so in the next few weeks. Um, and I'm also not able to actually talk about how the world will end in my particular episode. I will say this, once you see it, you will know it's mine, and I am very proud of it. So definitely watch out for it. The series has been airing, so uh, there are episodes out there. Uh, There are two more to air. Mine, again, will be one of the last two. So definitely watch the History Channel for for that particular show. Well, it sounds like I ought to ask you for a job here. (laughs) Now that my show's ended, I'm looking for a job myself. Well, it won't do me any good then. (laughs) Do you have any any convention appearances coming up or anything like that that uh, people might be able to see you? Uh, I don't, yeah, at the top of my head, no, I don't think I have any uh, schedule. I just, I did about five or six uh, lectures this year, which is, uh, it's been harder to travel now that my little guy is, uh, is here. My son's now two and a half. So before he was born, it was a little bit easier to travel. Now it's a little bit tougher, uh, but did about five or six this year and was able to travel around. Nothing on the books yet. Uh, at least not as we speak. couple things cooking, maybe, uh, a couple appearances here in the States, uh, but nothing, uh, nothing is set yet. Well, John, thank you very much for taking the time to 
talk to us about the Black Vault. Once again, that's www.theblackvault.com. Uh, appreciated the uh, information about FOIA and the Tehran case. My pleasure. My pleasure. And for those of you who are interested, it's still in the Roswell case. You can take a look at um, Roswell in the 21st century that's available all over the place. And uh, for more information about some of the topics we talked here about, about here and things like that, take a look at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and be sure to listen to some of the other fine programs on the Exxon Broadcast Network and take a look at their website at uh, xzbn.net. And we will return in 147 hours.